So, on the first video lecture, we did the object relational mapping of our project from the database. We created Timex Auto Web, which now has all the Hibernate mappings, all the entities, all the managers, and the Hibernate Util working. Now we need to transform this project into a Spring project. Okay? And there are several ways of doing this. There is the automatic way, which is using wizards, and there is also the manual way. But I'm going to start with the manual way so that you guys have a better sense of what it takes. The idea is that I'm going to implement the equivalent to timesheet list in this project. And I'm going to be using not only Hibernate, but I'm going to also be using Spring. So the way to do that is we have to add Spring Framework to our project. So if you guys remember, Timex Auto Web is a web project. And as a web project, it's, it has a deployment in the scripter, the web XML. If you guys remember way, way, way back from week one or two, I can't remember what it was, I created another web project called the First Servlet Project. And if you take a look at the web XML for that project, it actually not only had the welcome file list, but it also had a servlet defined. And this servlet was represented by a class. And this servlet had a mapping. So the name of the servlet was my servlet. It was represented by this class. And it will get executed every time that we have this in the URL, this pattern the front slash my servlet. So if we take a look at my servlet class, it was a very simple class. It was one that extends from HTTP servlet and it will implement the do get. And all it did was print out hello world in h1 tags. Very simple servlet. Well, to transform our Timex Auto Web into a Spring project, we have to do something similar to what we did in my servlet, except that the servlet is coming from the Spring framework. So, <coughs> to our deployment descriptor is we're going to have to declare in here a servlet that it's coming from the Spring Framework. And in fact, if you guys remember when I covered the architecture of this project, I told you guys that there's one very important servlet in the Spring Framework. It's the one that catches everything and introduces um, introduces the Spring Framework to the web project, and that is called the Dispatcher Servlet. And that's exactly the first change that we have to do. That servlet in our web XML project okay and we're going to call this servlet, we're going to call it the Timex Auto Web. Web. And just as I call this servlet Timex Auto Web, and it's going to be represented by this class in the Spring Framework, I'm also making sure that this mapping corresponds to the same servlet name. So these two must match. 
Timex Auto Web, and it's going to look for any URL pattern that ends in .htm. And it could have been, it could have been, I know, I don't know, it could have been uh, .do. I've seen many projects where they have the .do, and the .do means it will be taken care of by the Spring Framework. It could have been .execute or whatever you want, but basically the um, project will look for this pattern in the URL, anything that ends in .htm, and if it finds it, it's going to delegate it to this servlet, the dispatcher servlet. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look at what that dispatcher server looks like. So I'm going to hit the F3 so that I can see the uh, source code and what do I get? The same problem that I got with Hibernate. It says, I'm sorry, I know where the dispatcher server is. I can show you the bytecode. It's actually under the org spring framework web servlet package in the spring.jar but I cannot show you the source code so what I did was I downloaded I went to Google and if you go into the distribution folder of that spring framework you will find a file called the spring src.zip this zip contains the entire source code for the spring framework 2.08 version which is the closest one that we're using to this jar. So I'm going to attach the source. It's going to be an external file. I'm going to attach that source so I can actually see the source code for the Spring Framework Dispatcher Servlet. I'm going to select that one. OK. And here is our Dispatcher Servlet. And Fair enough, the dispatcher servlet extends from the framework servlet, which extends from an HTTP servlet bean, which extends from HTTP servlet. So it's basically the same kind of class that we created back a few weeks ago on our first servlet project, is that it should extend from the HTTP, HTTP servlet anyway. Uh, so given that, that means that from now on, anything that you want the Spring Framework to take over, all you have to do is ask for something that ends in HTM, and it will do it. All right. So that's the first change that you got to do in the project. What else do we have to do? Well, this Spring Framework which starts with the dispatcher servlet also needs a configuration file. Just like the Hibernate needs a configuration file, the Spring also needs a configuration file. And typically the name of this configuration file will be the name of the project dash servlet.xml. Now you can change that configuration but then you will have to do a lot more configuration on your own. So if you leave the default, let's copy it into our Timex Auto Web and paste it in there and then I'm going to rename it and it's going to be called Timex Auto Web Dash Servlet Dot XML. So if I open that configuration file, I'm going to see a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to need this XML file. And we're going to say that the simple URL handler mapping, and if I hold over that class, it's a, it's a Spring Framework class. This Spring Framework class, which is part of the configuration in Spring, um, 
if you read about it, it's the implementation of the handler mapping interface, which basically what it does, it maps URLs to request handlers. So it knows that, hey, if it finds this in the URL, it knows who can handle that request. And remember, URLs are requests, all of them. So basically what we're going to do here is if we're going to tell the simple URL handling mapping, if you find timesheet list.htm, I want you to call the timesheet list controller. That's basically what we're saying here. Okay? And this Spring Framework class called the Simple URL Handler Mapping will take care of that. All you have to do is set up the property with the key timesheetList.htm, front slash timesheetList.htm, and tell it to redirect that request to the timesheet list controller handler. So we have to define, under the, our controller section, we have to define a, f a bean with the same name, the timesheet list controller. Here it is. Now that bean, which is another term for a Java class, right, that has properties, getters, and setters, that bean is represented by this class. And we're going to have to create this class. It's called a timesheet list controller. And this timesheet list controller will know how to create a list of timesheets for a particular employee and send that list of timesheets to a view, which is going to be eventually a Java server page that will render the timesheet list. And this is pretty cool because right there you are seeing the implementation of the MVC pattern. MVC, which stands for Model View Controller. The model is going to be the timesheet, which we already have that from back from our first video lecture. Um, we already had a timesheet entity with a timesheet manager that knows how to manage timesheets. And we're going to have to implement a controller called the timesheet list controller that implements that functional requirement, listing timesheets for a particular employee. And we're going to have to implement a view, which is a Java server page that renders that list of timesheets. Now, the neat thing about it is that Spring uses um, injection inversion of control to inject uh, classes. So we know that the timesheet list controller is going to need a timesheet manager somehow. So we're going to create a property called timesheet manager and we're going to inject a bean that represents the timesheet manager. We're also going to need another property called a success view which will tell the timesheet list controller what's the name of the view to go to when it, it it when it successfully completes whatever it has to complete and we're not going to use any one of these yet and that's it so we're just going to need a timesheet list controller class that has two properties the timesheet manager and the success view now this timesheet manager is represented by notice the ref tag with the bean name is represented by the team timesheet manager. So we have to create a timesheet manager. And here it is. It's actually not called timesheet manager, but timesheet home, if you guys remember. And it's coming from the Timex Auto Web domain. From the Timex Auto Web domain package. So I'm making the adjustments here. It's a fully qualified name of the class. So 
So remember, we don't have managers, we have home. Those are the ones that were automatically created by our Hibernate wizards. So now, if we go and look at the timesheet manager, do an F3, it will load timesheet home. Here it is. So we have our timesheet home. It's going to be Timex Auto Web Controllers. So now we have to create this package. And we're going to have to create this class inside that package. So let's do that. That's the next thing that we got to do to transform this project into a Spring project. So let's create. Um, I have to be in the Java EE or Java perspective to do this. Of course, it's under source. Let's create a new package. And the name of the package is going to be com that dot timex auto web dot controllers. Okay. And we're gonna create in there our timesheet list controller. So I'm not gonna so this is what the timesheet list controller, at least the last version of it looks like. Okay. So bear with me. I'm going to organize the imports. I don't need this. All right. So we're ready with our timesheet list controller. So timesheet list controller is a class that implements controller. So what is a controller? I and mean, actually, if you have attached the Spring source code like I did, you will be able to see not only the information about that class, it's actually an interface, but you can also see the source code for it. This is what a controller looks like. If you look at it, it doesn't get any more simple than this. It's a bunch of documentation of what a controller is, and then at the end it says it's an interface which means that all the classes that implement this interface must implement handle request. Handle request is the name of a function that returns a model in view and we're going to see what that means and what it looks like and it has two parameters the request which is an HTTP server request and the response which is also an HTTP server response so basically, it will handle re the request of an HTTP request. And it will handle in such a way that it will return a model in view. What is a model in view? A model in view in the Spring Framework is basically that. It's a model and a view. Two objects encapsulated into one class called the model in view. So remember, we're implementing the model in view, mo the MVC pattern in Spring. So for every controller, you're going to need a model that handles the request and a view that will show the result of that request. And that's what the controller is doing. The controller is actually providing a model in view for a specific functionality and it's all done through the controller. So our timesheet list controller implements that controller, which means it has to have a handle request. Very well. Let's see how we're going to do the handle request. Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to ask our timesheet manager to get timesheets for a specific employee. And our employee right now, we're going to hard code it because we just need to get this functionality out, out of the way. Get it done, and then we later f figure out how to do it for any employee. So right now, I'm hard coding the employee to be just employee number one. 
which I believe from the database um, employee no number one is Mike Dover so I'm going to be giving you a list of timesheets for Mike Dover now notice that it says that the timesheet manager doesn't know what get timesheets looks like so we're going to have to go into the timesheet manager which is a timesheet home and we're going to have to implement the get timesheets we don't have a get timesheets we have a find by example find by ID merge delete these 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 were pretty much the cruds that will handle timesheets but sometimes we want to be able to get a list of timesheets for a particular employee so we haven't implemented that that's something that we have to implement um, that method we have to implement it which we call it the get timesheets or you can call it whatever you want but we we have called it the get timesheets so uh, that functionality so I'm just going to add it at the end of the class and so this get timesheets will uh, return a list of all the timesheets of all the timesheets for a matching employee ID so obviously you're passing the employee ID as a parameter so what do we do here we create a variable called timesheet list which is a list of timesheet and then we're going to use hibernate util to get the session factory get the current session begin the transaction you know pretty much the same stuff that we've been doing here um, and then we're going to call the session and say hey I want you to create the following query from type sheet where employee ID equals question mark and we're going to be passing that parameter remember that's the employee ID that is being passed as a parameter to the, to the function and the status code is different than timesheet paid wait a minute what is timesheet paid well remember hibernate created timesheet for us I want to see it where is it here it is this is what timesheet looks like this is all automatically generated for us by hibernate tools so it doesn't really tell me the possible values for for a status code it just says that status code is a status for a timesheet and it's a character but there is no real definition in the timesheet of all the possible status code and think about this if you have a class where one of your attributes in the class can only have some particular finite set of values what you want to do is you want to declare that finite set of values inside the class and give it a name that way you can refer to them by their name anywhere in the code and this is how it's done in my timesheet class so they are and they're going to be public public static because they're constant and final so anywhere I should be able to say timesheet dot submitted and that means an S timesheet dot pending and that means a P timesheet dot approved and that means an A and you get the point so in here now I can refer to timesheet dot paid as the status code of the timesheets that I want so notice that um, <coughs> notice that in our query what we're asking 
The session is to create a query to get me all the timesheets whose employee ID equals 1, eventually it's going to be passed as a parameter number 1, and the status code is different than timesheet paid. And we're going to get a list. And that list will be returned to our handle request in our timesheet list controller. And it's going to be a list of timesheets. And then what are we going to do? Just for logging purposes, what we're going to do is we're going to log the following debugging statement. We're going to say showing timesheets for, and we're going to put for employee num uh, ID equals. one because it's hard coded you know and then we're going to return a model in view it's a new model in view and what this what's this going to be this model in view well the view is going to be get the success view from here so where's the success view it's whatever is being saved in the success view property of the class but wait a minute we are injecting that value you guys remember? We are in injecting that value. Where from? From the configuration. The spring configuration. We are actually saying we're going to inject a property called success view and we're going to inject the following value. Timesheet list. Okay? So in here, we're going to create a model in view, and the view is going to be timesheet list. We're also going to create a bunch of name value pairs, which they're going to be part of our model. Name value pairs. So here's the name. The name is going to be map key, which is a constant, called timesheets. So I'm going to call it timesheets var just to differentiate timesheets var okay in fact i'm going to call it jsp var timesheets jsp var and i'm going to associate to that key the timesheets the timesheet that i just got from my timesheet manager you know all the timesheets from mike dover that are not paid Okay, and that's what I'm going to do at this point. That's all I'm going to do at this point. That's it. So pretty much, our timesheet list controller is a class that implements controller, which means it has to implement a handle request function. It has getters and setters for each one of the properties and there's only two properties the timesheet manager which gets injected and the success view which also gets injected as a matter of fact I'm going to put them right here right next to each other that's it the view will eventually get this variable called timesheet JSP var. And the view, which right now is just called timesheet list, and in fact, you know what? I should just call it something else. Let's call it timesheet list. Uh, no, it has to be timesheet list. Yeah, it has to be timesheet list. So at this point, the controller is going to send that list of timesheets under the name timesheets JSP var to that view. But we don't know how is the view associated to a JSP. Well, that's something that is configured in as well in the in the spring configuration. We actually have and we can have several view resolvers if you if you want. We 
okay but in this particular one we only need one view resolver and it's the one that is going to map our view names to a JSP now who is going to handle that well there is a spring framework class called the internal resource view resolver and if you read about it a little bit it's a convenient subclass of the URL based view resolver that supports internal resource view so any resource view any res any um, view name that we have internally in our in our um, servlets okay will be mapped and it's, that's done by this internal resource view resolver will be mapped to a particular path in a particular name in the project. So let's see what it's going to do. Well, it's going to have a view class that is represented by this JSTL view, and, and you, you know what that JSTL means now because you, you guys are supposed to, um, to know JSPs. JSTL stands for Java Standard Tag Library. So basically, this class is going to um it's going to grab our view and render it as a JSP. Okay? Uh map it to a JSP. And we're gonna pass also another property called the prefix. And the prefix will tell the internal resource view resolver where to find that JSP. So we're gonna have to create a JSP folder inside our webinf and that's where all our spring configured JSPs will live so by the way I have to create that folder which I haven't created so under webinf I'm going to create a new folder and it's going to be called JSP so notice that now we have two types of JSPs we have our index JSP living above web content, which is our our home page. Doesn't have any right now at this moment. Doesn't have any dynamic stuff, right? It's just a home page, static home page, even though it has JSP extension. And our Spring configured JSPs will live under the WebInf JSP folder. And they will have the suffix. That's another property that is being passed to the internal re resource view resolver. It will have a suffix, obviously, of JSP. So basically, what it's going to do is going to take this timesheet list view, which got injected into the timesheet list controller, and it's going to pass it to this internal resource view resolver. And all this one is going to do is going to prefix webinf JSP to it and suffix it with dot JSP. So basically what we're going to have to create here under this folder is we're going to have to create a timesheet list dot JSP file. And I have done that already. In fact that timesheet list dot JSP started as a static HTML which you guys should already have that in place started as a static HTML of what it of what a timesheet list functionality will look like and then uh, all I did was rename it to JSP and added a few a few um, Java statements so I'm um, basically this one will not going to do any of that stuff because we're not passing an employee but basically what it's going to do is it's going to receive a variable called timesheets JSP var okay and we're going to do an iteration over each one of those timesheets in that list and each one we're going to call it T and what we're going to do is we're just going to list them. We're going to um, create anchors 
and uh, link, uh, you know, anchors to different pages. We're going to show the period ending date. We're going to show the total minutes. That's something that we haven't implemented yet uh, on a timesheet. And um, the department name associated to the timesheet and the status code and the timesheet ID. We're going to be showing all that stuff in the JSP. Okay. So, so far so good. Let's see if this works. How do we test this stuff? Well, it's a web project. So, the best way to test it is, let's clean it up and deploy it to our Tomcat. Cat 6. And this is the project running. Yeah, it looks awful. Why? Very simple. Because it's trying to render index.jsp. That's the welcome page, home page, with no cascading style sheets whatsoever. Call it styles, the styles folder. So under the web content, I put styles. And styles has a default cascading style sheet. This is the one that is going to give me a nice look and feel. I'm going to refresh. And this is what the, is the look and feel. Now, I'm missing the logo and stuff. Yes, I know. Because also as part of the essentials. Um, so I'm going to copy into the web content and then I'm going to refresh and here it is. This is my home page. Okay? Now, the real test. What is, what is the real test? I'm going to put in the URL timesheetlist.htm timesheetlist.htm Remember, that's what we configured. We told Spring in the web, in the web XML. Anything that ends in HTM will be taken care of by the dispatcher servlet. The dispatcher servlet has this configuration that says, if in the URL you see timesheet list at HTM, make sure that you send it to the timesheet list controller. We're going to get this to run. Timesheet list. Ready? Hit it. Whoa! Exceptions. Serverlet init for cyclist timex auto web through an exception. Okay. Timesheet list controller defined in this serverlet context can't resolve reference to being timesheet manager while setting the property timesheet manager. Okay. So basically, we're having problems with Timesheet Manager, Timex Auto Web Domain, Timesheet Home, which is a bean that gets injected into Timesheet List Controller. Let me see why. Of course. So the property is called Timesheet Manager. Is it? I don't know. Let's take a look at the Timesheet List Controller. Yeah, the property is called Timesheet Manager. We have a getter and setter for it. Session factor, which comes from, from the Hibernate. Sorry about this. You know, we're just trying to modify a lot of stuff that was automatically created for us by the by the wizards. Get rid of that. So instead of that, get session factory, get session factory, get session factory, get session factory. Get session factory. 
you know, this is if you want to be able to reuse the uh, the automatic CRUDs that were generated. You don't have to. I mean, you can actually just implement the functions in the manager, in the entity manager, that you need to fulfill a specific functional requirement. We're going to clean the project. The server should detect the changes. It should auto deploy. Okay, so it's deployed. Which, by the way, how do I know that? You can set it up. If you double click on your server, it will tell you that there are timeouts. There's 45 seconds before it times out when it starts. If your server doesn't start in 45 seconds, it will just time out. Same thing with stop. If it doesn't stop in 15 seconds, it will time out. And in the publishing section, notice that it automatically publish when the resources change. So when everything, when anything changes in your project, if it's being deployed to that Tomcat server, if it detects any changes, it will automatically publish the new version. Test. Let's refresh. Looks better. Looks much better. Ouch! Unknown column, blah, blah, blah. I, th I think somebody got all these server exceptions and they posted in the forum. And there's a solution to that. So here's Hibernate Util loading the configuration, right? So far, so good. Unknown column, employee ID in the work clause. Where? In the work clause of what? So we have to go into our get timesheets timesheet home line 132 and indeed you see an employee ID wait a minute from timesheet so I go into my timesheet class do I have an employee ID do I have an employee ID no Well, no wonder it doesn't know what. It's not employee ID. It's ID. Where ID, right? No. No. Let's go back to the database. employee underscore ID employee underscore ID that's the name of my column in the timesheet uh, table that gives me the reference to the employee that owns this timesheet but wait a minute I'm saying from timesheet so I should be able to configure somehow timesheet ID to that employee. Oh, it's skipped. It's skipped by the by the object relational mapper. As you guys see, it loads automatically the employee. That's why it doesn't need a reference to I, I wonder if this is going to work. That's that's a good question. Okay, let's see. Now, the status code does exist, right? Status code, yeah. That's the status code of the timesheet. You know what? This might not work. We might have to do the following. We might have to do, instead of employee ID, we might have to do employee.id. Let's, let's check it out. Um, let's try it again. Did we change? What did we change? Yeah, we changed code. So let's clean it up. It did. It did work. Okay. It's deploying it again. All right. That's good. And we're going back to our test timesheet list.htm run it. It's running. 
Whoa. Now we're getting into the JSP. So it, it ran. Somehow the query ran. I don't know what it did. And, and this is where you can adjust the logging to the level that you need to see if it really run or not. Um, building session factor could now load binding exception. The eventual follow stack trace well, uh, is caused by whatever cannot load com mysql jdbc util i've seen this right property timesheet id not found oh wow there is a whole bunch of errors now they are coming from timesheet list at jsp on line 103 so if we look at line 103 Indeed, we're trying to print the timesheet ID, and we're calling it timesheet ID, which is not right. That's incorrect. Let's go into the JSP, and let's fix that. First of all, it's not employee code, it's employee type. So let's do a global replace of that. It's employee type. What else? In the timesheet, it's not timesheet ID. This is another change that I did. It's actually just called ID. So I'm going to replace that, replace that, replace that. That's it. Is it called status code? Yes. Superior ending date? Yeah. What's the error? Property total minutes is not found. Yeah, no kidding. Total minutes on timesheet? Have we done that? Let me see. Timesheet. Nowhere in here you will find total minutes. Why? Because that's not a column in timesheet's table. It's actually a calculation. And that calculation is minutes Monday plus Tuesday plus Wednesday for all the minutes of the week. That's the total minutes. So we have to add a function. We can do that. We can add a function that is not a getter or setter, that is not a constructor, to the timesheet code, that is not a constant like we did here. It's a function that manipulates somehow properties of the entity and produces something. In this case, the perfect example is get total minutes. So how do we implement get total minutes? Okay. So now we have a new function called get total minutes. Notice that it's a get total minutes and I want you to see why it's so important that you call it get total minutes. And it, all it does is it returns the minutes Monday plus Tuesday all the way, you know, the sum of all of the minutes. Now, why is it important that you call it get total minutes? Because in the JSP, when you call it, you're about to show it, you call it T dot total minutes. And t is, remember, t is the one variable, t is the one variable that represents each one of the timesheets from the list of timesheets that you're passing to the JSP. So it's very important that you call it get total minutes because 
every single function call from the JSP to a model will get prefixed with the GET lowercase and it will camel case the rest of the name. So if you want total minutes, you specify in the JSP total minutes lowercase t capital M and in the model you implement a get total minutes lowercase g e t uppercase t total uppercase m minutes you get it if you go by that convention you will not have any problems with your JSPs so Let's repackage this this thing or clean it up, I'm sorry. It redeployed web timesheet list.htm. Now, many of you actually implement functional requirements and you expect me to type that in the URL. I will not do that. You have to actually modify your menus so that I can get to that place from the menus. And this is the reason why. So I make mistakes. Timex Auto Web. Where is it? Yeah, slash, and that. All right. Error reading name. Now we're getting somewhere, but there's no such thing as name. From where? Error reading name on type Timex Auto Web Domain Department. So somewhere in the timesheet list, we have a name. So let's do a search by name. Name, name, employee name. Ha! T.department.name. It's not working. Why? T.department.name. Let me see. T is what? T is one timesheet from the list of timesheets that are being passed. Okay. So let's take a look at what a timesheet looks like. Indeed, timesheet has a department. Okay. And if we take a look at what a department looks like, indeed, a department has a name. So we should be able to say t.department.name. And we should have a get department in timesheet. Yeah. So indeed we have that get department. Remember, we have to go through the conventions. And then name should also have a getter, a get name in the department. Here it is. Name. Get name. So the only thing that is left to uh, debug is that maybe it's not loading dot department for that timesheet. So in fact, at the point in which you want to use it, it doesn't exist. Error reading name on type department. And then at the time that you want to initialize that proxy, the owning session was already closed. So it's saying, you know what, I'm trying to load it, but I just can't load it. 
So here's the deal. And this is going back to the Hibernate mappings. Okay. If we take a look at the Hibernate mappings, we're saying that let's take a look at the Hibernate map for timesheet. We're saying that when you load a timesheet and you want to get the department, there's nothing that says what the lazy um, property is. And the lazy typically has been assigned as true when you want to load the payments. So if you have a timesheet and you want to load the corresponding payment of the timesheet, it will load it in a lazy fashion, which means it will not immediately load it when you load the timesheet, it would only load it when it needs it. The problem is, when it needs it, this session is already closed. And that's because we have our managers opening the session right here, the transaction, doing whatever it needs to do, and then committing it, and then closing the session. Okay? So that's a problem. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to set up our relationships between the entities and in fact, you know, which is the same relationship between the tables as lazy faults. So let's do that from the timesheet perspective for now. Let's add a lazy false. Apparently it is lazy by default. So if you don't specify lazy, it will be lazy by default, lazy true. And let's do that for the department. And we don't need the payments right now. Okay, so we're... And then we try it again. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is the implementation of timesheet list. I'm showing the timesheets from Mike Dover, employee number one, coming from the database. Two, four, six timesheets. <coughs> Let's see if that's true. Employee number one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven timesheets. How many do we have here? Six. But one of them is a C, which means has been paid. Status code has been paid. So I'm not showing those. I'm just showing two A's, one S. 2 A's, 1 S, 1, 2, 2 more S's, 2 more S's, and finally 1 A, 1 A. So this is what timesheet list looks like for Mike Dover. Right now, there's no authentication. There's no login. We're hard coding the parameter of the employee where we want the timesheet. What is really important at this point, and I want you to understand this when you implement it on your project for next week, is that first of all, it has the same look and feel as the static HTML that you provided to me when you said, I'm going to implement this functional requirement. It's going to look like this. Second of all, it has to come up not with fake data, but data from the database. So this data that I'm presenting is real data. Okay? You can hard code the employee, but you cannot hard code the timesheet list.
I needed to get familiar with JSPs. If this was a struggle, if creating the JSP was a struggle, I need you to download the book that I made available for you. It's called Beginning Java Server Pages. It just gives you the basic stuff that you need to know in order to create Java Server Pages. It's a few tags that you need to know and a few syntax, conventional syntax that you need to know in order to provide a Java Server Page working. But other than that, this is it. This is the manual way of transforming a web application into a Spring web application. SP. Straightforward. Request to dispatch your server. Dispatch your server to the controller. Controller to the models. The models to the database. Back the data as objects. Create the model in view. Send it to the JSP. And you're going to be doing this nine more times. You're going to be implementing in a very similar fashion all the other nine functional requirements. 